exposed, part of the ecumenical movement. Not the old ecumenical movement, <clears throat> which tried to unite church organizations while ignoring their creeds, but a new ecumenical movement that is far more dangerous. The new ecumenism wants to unite church organizations, to be sure, but at first wants to make clear that there are no significant theological differences between the churches. Its leaders seem to be convinced that theologically there isn't a dime's worth of difference between most Protestant churches and the Roman state church. And in one sense, that's correct. Today's Protestant churches are almost as corrupt and apostate as the Roman church herself. Charles Colson, <clears throat> one of the leaders of this new ecumenical movement, expressed his fundamental ecumenical ideas in these words, and I quote, The pain and distrust between Catholics and Protestants goes back centuries. The church has often been plagued by wars within her walls, crippling her in her battle against the encroaching armies of secularism. But at root, those who are called of God, whether Catholic or Protestant, are part of the same body. What they share is a belief in the basics, the virgin birth, the deity of Christ, his bodily resurrection, his imminent return, and the authority of his infallible word. They also share the same miss mission, presenting Christ as Savior and Lord to a needy world. It's high time that all of us who are Christians come together, regardless of the differences in our confessions and our traditions, and make common cause to bring Christian values to bear in our society. When the barbarians are scaling the walls, there's no time for petty, petty quarreling in the camp. That's the end of the quote from Colson. Notice what he says. He first says that, quote, the church has been crippled by wars within her walls. His premise is that Romanists and Protestants are part of the same church. What makes them part of the same body is their common doctrine, he says. And Colson lists five fundamental doctrines held in common. Sometimes this point is made in a more scholarly way when someone asserts that Protestants have the early councils, the so-called ecumenical councils, in common with the Catholics. Now, Robert Zins has written an excellent analysis of one book by the Thomas Norman Geisler and Ralph McKenzie that makes this contention. Whether stated in the popular way Colson says it, or more formally as scholars say it, this fundamental doctrinal unity between the systems of Romanism and Protestantism does not exist. And I'll give you a single example. One of the ones that Colson mentions, the doctrine of Scripture. Colson calls it the authority of his infallible word. But what's common to Protestants and Catholics, or to Romanism and historical Protestantism? Well, Rome says there are 73 books and a few fragments that make up his infallible word. Protestantism says there are 66 books and no fragments. Second, Rome says that she wrote the books of Scripture, and not only did she write them, she approves and authenticates them. Historic Protestantism says that the books of Scripture are prior to the Church, they called forth and they created the Church, and they judge and authenticate the Church. Third, Romanism actually denies the sufficiency, the inerrancy, the historical reliability, the scientific accuracy, and the clarity of Scripture. Historical Protestantism asserts all of these. Romanism and historic Protestantism have nothing in common on the doctrine of Scripture. Those who assert that they do simply display their ignorance of what Rome and the Scriptures teach. Furthermore, if one were to look at the rest of the so-called fundamental common doctrines, he would find similar divergences. The Bible says that Christ was born of a virgin but not a sinless, perfect, perpetual virgin who was bodily assumed into heaven where she functions as mediatrix and co-redemptrix. The historical mother of Jesus, a godly young Hebrew woman, and the Virgin Mary in Roman theology are two different persons, just as the historical Jesus and the liberal Jesus are two different persons. Tonight, uh, Timothy Kaufman will give us extensive evidence about the identity of the Romanist Mary. The Roman state church did not invent, but it enthusiastically adopted and perfected as its central theological method the art of equivocation. 
the Jesuits then raised the art of equivocation to a science. <clears throat> As Christians, we must never be fooled by two people using the same words, but ascribing different meanings to those words. We must never forget that the meaning of terms is determined by the system in which they appear. When Paul said in Athens, in him we live and move and have our being, he was not asserting Greek pantheism, although he quoted a pantheist. He did not sign a manifesto with the philosophers of Athens, setting forth what they agreed on. Paul used the same Greek words as the pagans, but their meaning had changed, being determined by the Christian system of thought in which Paul placed them. Today, there are many pious fools operating seminaries, churches, and parachurch organizations who have yet to learn that elementary point of logic. They think that because genuine Protestants use some of the same words as Romanists, or because Romanists use some of the same words as the Bible, that they're all talking about the same thing. They should be required to take a course in logic and to memorize the definition of equivocation. <clears throat> Colson goes on to say, after asserting that Protestants and Romanists have fundamental doctrines in common, that we should put aside the remaining minor differences and unite to fight secularism. Why Colson finds secularism a greater threat than false religions, I don't know. The greatest enemies of Christianity have always been false religions. It was not secularists who crucified Christ, it was false religions. It was not secularists who persecuted Christians in the first century, it was false religionists. It was not secularists who ruined ancient Israel. It was false religion, religionists. The ancient pro, uh, prophets denounced the false religions of their times. Quite frankly, friends, the 18th century Enlightenment did less harm to Christianity than medieval Romanism or modernism. Colson, being a political animal, calls for a united front against the barbarians scaling the walls. He denies that the barbarians are already within the walls, and barbarians ruled and ruined all the churches for a thousand years, and for the past 500 years, most of the churches professing to be Christian. If we're going to make alliances for political purposes, why should Christians not ally themselves with secularists to protect ourselves against the growing world empire of the Roman state church? But of course, all such alliances, whether with false religionists or with secularists, are forbidden by scripture. Charles Colson lived in the first century. He would have scolded Paul for criticizing and cursing the Judaizers. After all, the Judaizers agreed on most fundamental doctrines with the Galatians and even with Paul. And their help was needed to fight the pagan barbarians assaulting Western civilization. What was Paul thinking? Surely he should have agreed at least to a co-belligerency, to use the late Francis Schaeffer's phrase, with the Judaizers against the pagans. <clears throat> Instead, Paul cursed the Judaizers over some minor point of doctrine like justification, and he divided the fledgling and struggling church. Even though the Judaizers believed in God, they believed in the deity of Christ, they believed in his birth of a virgin, they believed in his return to earth, and they believed in the authority of Scripture. The Judaizers believe the fundamental doctrines that Colson says Romanists and Protestants have in common. Paul, judged by Colson's standards, was a divisive fool. Paul not only did not seek a co-belligerency with the Judaizers, he did not seek to co-evangelize the world with them. He should have done both. Had Paul done so, Western civilization would have been saved, and the Roman Empire might never have fallen to the barbarians scaling the walls. So we must conclude that Edward Gibbon and the pagan Romans were right and Augustine was wrong. The fall of Rome was indeed the fault of the Christians. Colson lived in the 16th century. He would have berated Luther and Calvin for their divisiveness in the face of the imminent threat from the Turk. In fact, the reformers were repeatedly criticized for splitting Christendom when Islam threatened it. But Luther, Calvin, and Paul knew what was important. And what is important is not a united political or social front, and certainly not a united theological front, against pagans and secularists. It was the gospel. On truth, especially the truth of justification by faith alone, there can be no compromise, even if it means splitting churches.
Until American Christians learn that lesson, we will continue our descent into papal Rome. Part of the immediate problem is that so-called evangelical churches and leaders spent most of the mid-20th century separating themselves from those who preached separation from unbelief. The neo-evangelicals had such a horror of separation that they had to separate from the fundamentalists. Harold Henry was one of the leaders of the neo-evangelicals. He and others wanted to lead a movement that would distance itself from fundamentalism and neo-evangelicalism was born. This in turn led quickly to Billy Graham's acceptance of liberal churches as sponsors of his crusades in the 1950s and in the 1960s to acceptance of Romanist churches as sponsors of his crusades. What the Bible teaches on theological and ecclesiastical separation was ignored and compromised though under different labels became the modus operandi of the neo-evangelicals. It was called cooperation and who is antisocial enough to oppose cooperation? It was called engagement, and who is isolationist enough to oppose engagement? It was called co-belligerence, a metaphor borrowed from war in which two parties fighting a third party do not fight each other. But the idea of co-belligerence, let alone the notions of cooperation and alliance, is itself a betrayal of Christ. It is abandoning spiritual warfare for cultural warfare. Co-belligerence involves deciding that Christians will neither criticize Roman Catholicism, nor evangelize Roman Catholics, nor criticize Arminianism, nor evangelize Arminians, nor criticize Judaism, nor evangelize Jews, for example, because they are our allies in the cultural wars against the seculars. But fighting cultural wars is not the Great Commission. Scripture knows only theological wars. And in those wars, all unbiblical thoughts and institutions are the enemies of Christ. Therefore, making a separate peace with any one of them, as co-belligerency requires, is treason. American churchgoers have become interested in these cultural wars, partly because of the cultural mandate. In some circles, the cultural mandate has been substituted for the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the United States, it has become the conservative counterpart to the liberal social gospel. In Canada, the cultural mandate is the socialist gospel. The Western civilization that Charles Colson and his ilk are attempting to save cannot be saved by the cultural gospel, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. Only the preaching of the true gospel can defeat those principalities and powers. As I explained in my essay on Christianity and the Protestant Reformation, Western civilization is a byproduct of the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Byproduct of the Reformation. Now in the name of saving what is left of Western civilization, Colson and his ilk demand that we abandon the Reformation, make a theological, social, and political alliance with the Roman State Church, and battle the barbarians scaling the walls. Mr. Colson is ill-educated. His many ghostwriters have not served him well. He neither understands the source of Western civilization nor what is required to save it. Just as the individual's eternal salvation is entirely in the hands of Christ, so a civilization's temporal salvation depends entirely on Christ. And if his gospel is ignored, disbelieved, or despised as Colson and his tribe despise it, then Christ will surely and swiftly bring that civilization to an end. All power in heaven and on earth has been given to Christ. It is clear that the movement in non-Catholic churches, represented by evangelicals and Catholics together, is a betrayal of the Reformation, of the martyrs, of the gospel, and of Christ himself. If Charles Colson is right... Martin Luther and John Calvin need to apologize to the Pope. But while it is necessary to recognize spiritual treason for what it is, and to denounce it in no uncertain terms, denunciation is not sufficient. More important than denunciation is understanding. Why have contemporary Protestants abandoned the faith of their father and rushed to Rome? Books could be written on the subject, but all I can do, or hope to do this evening, 
is offer some thoughts that might serve as a basis for further discussion and elaboration. Exactly what are the causes of the present apostasy? Such things do not happen in a vacuum, mysteriously and inexplicably, nor do they happen suddenly. The present apostasy of American churches should have taken no one by surprise. It's been a long time coming. I want to discuss this evening how the rejection of the whole counsel of God has played out over the past 400 years. The central theme, the dominant motif of Christian theology since the time of the Reformation is a shift from the objectivity of Scripture to the subjectivity of the believer. This is similar to the development one finds in church history so far as we know anything about church history from the time of the Apostles to the Reformation. The great apostasy in the churches at, after that time of the Apostles until the 16th century when the pure gospel of Christ burst forth again and again turned the world upside down has been repeated in the centuries since the Reformation. Many of the same movements of thought that appeared in the centuries following the first have appeared in the centuries following the Reformation. There is, however, a dominant motif that characterizes these movements of thought. The motif might be called a movement from objectivity to subjectivity, from theocentrism to anthropocentrism, from worshiping and serving the Creator to worshiping and serving the creature. It affects various aspects of thought in different ways. For example, in the field of knowledge, the theory of knowledge, the apostles taught that the Bible, the written word of God, has a systematic monopoly on truth. All the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden in Christ. And I want to emphasize the all and the hidden. It's not some, it's not a few, it's not many, it's all. All the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden. That means we can't discover them. They're hidden in Christ. Unless he reveals them, we cannot know them. This is a claim to the systematic monopoly on truth by Scripture. All Scripture is inspired and completely equips the man of God for every good work. Man by his wisdom cannot know God. In fact, man by his wisdom cannot know anything, as Ecclesiastes says. The Scripture shines as a light in a dark place. But this systematic monopoly on truth, which is an objective theocentric view, soon came under attack. Some of those churchmen who had been influenced by philosophy wanted to make room for philosophical ideas. Those who had been influenced by other religions wanted to make room for non-biblical religious ideas and practices. The idea that there is more than one source of truth, variously called nature, reason, observation, experience, mysticism, feelings, philosophy, was accepted in many of the churches. This subjective idea developed in unsystematic ways until the 13th century when Thomas Aquinas wrote his summaries of patristic theology in which he incorporated the philosophy of Aristotle. There the notion that there are two or more sources of truth found its greatest expression in, in theology. Thomas made the same error that Eve had made millennia earlier. Rather than adhering to the objective word of God, he espoused the idea that sensation, observation, and experience are sources of truth could discover truth on his own. Epistemology became anthropocentric, not theocentric. Centuries after Thomas, generation reformers, Martin Luther and John Calvin, and even before them in the 14th century, John Wycliffe, had taught that truth is objective and that there's only one source of truth, scripture. Echoing the apostles, Wycliffe had written, all law, all philosophy, all ethics are in scripture, in Holy Scripture is all truth. Calvin wrote, I call that knowledge not what is innate in man, nor what is by diligence acquired, but what is revealed to us in the law and the prophets. Luther stated his shrift principle, his scripture principle, many times. Here's a typical formulation from Luther. Quote, Scripture in itself is most certain, most easily understood, most plain, is its own interpreter, approving, judging, and illuminating all the statements of all men. Therefore, nothing except the divine words are to be the first principles for Christians. All human words are conclusions drawn from them and must be brought back to them and approved by them." Unquote. Luther made scripture the axiom of his thought, the first principle. When he was ordered to recant, his reply was, 
Unless you can convince me by scripture and plain reason, I will not and cannot recant. Luther was not adding plain reason to scripture. As a source of truth, he was merely asserting that logic is a part of scripture itself, and unless his accusers could show him that he was wrong from scripture, and by reasoning from scripture, he would not and could not recant. Decline from this objectivity of the reformers began almost immediately, just as it had after the apostles. During the Reformation itself, the Anabaptists, the enthusiasts who are sometimes regarded mistakenly as part of the Reformation, also rejected Luther's shrift principle and taught that there were two sources of truth, the dead letter of Scripture and the living spirit of oral tr revelation. The dead letter of Scripture, of course, was objective, but the living voices and vivid visions in their heads were completely subjective. With such voices and visions, the enthusiasts needed no Scripture. Far from being part of the Reformation, the enthusiasts were an eruption of Romanist mysticism in the 16th century. Like the Romanists, they too held to oral and written revelation, the oral taking primacy over the written. Their epistemological position was the same as Rome's and was a denial of the epistemological objectivity of sola scriptura. Tragically, second generation reformers abandoned the view that scripture has a systematic monopoly on truth and returned to the view of Rome, crystallized in Thomistic philosophy that there are at least two sources of truth. Most did not follow the enthusiasts, enthusiasm reappeared later, but Thomas, Thomas Aquinas, who had been canonized by the Roman state church 50 years after his death, had taught for centuries that there are two sources of truth, sensation and revelation. Furthermore, Romanists, including Thomas, uh, broke revelation down into two types in order to destroy completely, but not obviously, the only objective source of truth, the scriptures. Revelation is both oral and written, Rome says, and the oral interprets the written. Protestants did not accept the Romanist distinction between oral and written revelations, but they did accept the Romanist notion that there are two sources of truth, one divine and one human. This early rejection of epistemological objectivity and sola scriptura led to many errors in both philosophy and theology. First, it precluded the Reformation from ever producing its own philosopher. It was not until the 20th century that God took a young man from Pennsylvania and taught him some of the philosophical implications of the principle of sola scriptura. His subsequent books developed that insight in ways that, had they been published 400 years earlier, might have changed the history of the world forever. But in the providence of God, the genius of Clark flared only as twilight was falling over Christendom just before dark. The abandonment or rejection of epistemological objectivity and sola scriptura in philosophy led to all sorts of philosophical movements that paved the roads back to Rome. For example, if there is a source of truth outside of scripture, then science, observation, experience, reason, feelings, other religions, common sense, philosophy, other inspired books, or some yet undiscovered source might furnish us with truth. Once the objective word of God was abandoned, a philosophical Pandora's box was opened. Mystics, who of course had flourished during the Dark Ages, reported their visions of Mary, Jesus, God, and other beings. Theologians, relying on their own opinions, developed various sorts of natural theology. Philosophers developed various theories of epistemologic, epistemology and the epistemological pluralism that resulted from Thomas's philosophy. Scientists told, the, told us that men are evolved animals and develop their language from grunts and squeals. Consequently, men cannot express or discuss divine truth accurately. Therefore, scripture itself is mythological. Since man is an animal, logic itself is suspect. It is merely a tool of survival. It's not the image of God in man. For man is not created but evolved from lower life forms. Logic has no value as a tool either to discover the truth or to explain the truth, but is at best rationalization. And you have Freud. Because no consistently reformed philosophy developed in the 16th and 17th centuries, the schools founded by the Protestants used texts adulterated with non-Christian ideas. 
schools quickly lost their theological bearings because they had no consistently Christian philosophical foundations. They became theologically corrupt and apostate more quickly than the general Protestant populace, and through their students they misled millions of ordinary Christians and churchgoers. In theology proper, the rejection of epistemological objectivity and sola scriptura supported all sorts of theological speculation, leading to deism and unitarianism, since reason is a source of truth, to pietism and modernism, since feelings are sources of truth, to Pentecostalism and the charismatic movement, since revelation is oral and subjective and not confined to scripture, and to neo-orthodoxy, since scripture is paradoxical, mysterious, and cannot be understood by our finite minds. All these groups in the 20th century became allies of Rome because they all are opposed to epistemological objectivity and the Christian axiom of sola scriptura. Rome has made accommodations for all sorts of subjectivists, from the evolutionists to the charismatics, because she recognizes that they all reject the biblical principle of sola scriptura. They all reject the rock on which the church is founded, and the Roman state church accepts the devotee of each error, the devotees of each error, so long as they acknowledge the authority of the papacy. Enthusiastically, the Reformation reached its zenith in the 17th century at the Westminster Assembly in London, the assembly that drafted the Westminster Confession of Faith and the larger and shorter catechisms. The confession adopted the epistemological objectivity of the apostles and early reformers. Its first chapter declares, and I quote, the whole counsel of God concerning all things necessary for his own salvation, for his own glory, man's salvation, faith, and life, is either expressly set down in Scripture or by good and necessary consequence may be deduced from Scripture unto which nothing at any time is to be added, whether by new revelations of the Spirit or traditions of men." Unquote. Both enthusiasm and Romanism were rejected. The Bible possesses a systematic monopoly on truth. A century earlier, John Calvin had published his Institutes of the Christian Religion, a work which is still, four and a half centuries later, the foremost comprehensive and systematic statement of Christian faith. Between these two dates, the life of Calvin and the Westminster Assembly, the errors of Arminius had surfaced and been condemned by the Synod of Dort in the Netherlands. Despite the Synod's denunciation, Arminius's errors, which were correctly recognized as a return to Romanist theology, prevailed in the churches started by the Reformation. Luther's bondage of the will, his devastating reply to Erasmus's Romanist theology and the freedom of the will, had been the manifesto of the Reformation. Tragically, no synod, nor as far as I am aware, any individual Christian recognized the fundamental problem, which was a man-centered epistemology. The rejection of objectivity and sola scriptura led to all sorts of errant and heretical ideas in all other aspects of thought. In the theory of reality, the sovereignty of God was denied by both the Roman state church and the Arminians. Not only could men obtain truth with their own free minds, they could obtain salvation with their own free wills. Here subjectivist religion ascribed independence from God to the will, as well as to the intellect. Pelagianism was the most blatant and consistent ancient statement of this view within the churches, but after the Reformation, first the Council of Trent, and then 50 years later a theologian named James Arminius denied the sovereignty of God and asserted the independence of men. Arminius, a Dutch theologian of the late 16th and early 17th centuries, caused the division in the Reformed churches by his denial of the sovereignty of God in at least five respects. Arminius asserted that man is not totally depraved, that election is not unconditional, but depends on God's foreseeing certain acts of elected men, that the atonement is not definite and actual, but indefinite and potential, depending on man's will and decision for its efficacy, that saving grace is irresistible by the free will of man, and that believers exercising their free will may lose their salvation and be eternally lost. Each of these positions is an attack on the sovereignty of God and an assertion of the independence of the creature. Each is an attack on objectivity and theocentrism and an assertion of subjectivity and anthropocentrism. Furthermore, all these ideas are found in Romanism. Arminius's heresies, though condemned by the Synod of Dort, swept through the Protestant churches in the 17th and 18th centuries, 
carrying them back to Rome's narthex. Roman state church philosophy is a rejection of epistemological objectivity and, and sola scriptura. She is at bottom an attack on the uh, sovereignty of God and an assertion of the independence of the creature. Those basic principles are worked out in great detail in Roman theology. And they appear and reappear in a hundred different forms. They appear in the form of natural law theory, on which not only Romanist theology, ethics, and politics are based, but also much Protestant theology, ethics, and social thought is based. The soteriological notion that in the fall man lost only a donum superadditum, a superfluous gift of righteousness that God had given him, leaving man not totally depraved but merely partially depraved, an idea that reappears in Arminianism. They appear in the notion that man can cooperate with God in his salvation. They appear in the notion that the sinner is justified, at least in part, by his personal righteousness. They appear in the notion that some sins are mortal, while others are not, in the notion that the bishops and priests can call the second person of the Trinity from heaven and imprison him, imprison him in a cracker, in the notion that the Roman state church has magisterial teaching authority, in the notion that the Roman state church dispenses divine grace, and in the notion that the Roman state church, because she represents God on earth, rightfully possesses all power in heaven and on earth. In historically Protestant churches, Arminianus' Arminius anthropocentric doctrines work themselves out in many theological forms. His denial of the definite atonement of Christ and assertion that Christ died for all men without exception, logically implied, no matter what Arminius, Arminius or his disciples said, that all men would eventually be saved. This universalism led first to an assertion that all are saved and later to a denial of the doctrine of eternal punishment. As a consequence of Arminius' denial of the efficacy of the atonement, hell disappears, but purgatory endures. It is the place where, after death, men continue their good works and complete their redemption. Both Rome and Arminius teach that good works are essential to salvation, that salvation can be lost by not doing the right works or by sinning just before one dies. In Romanism, this in turn led to the development of the plausible idea that there are venial sins, sins that are minor and do not deserve damnation, and mortal sins, which are major and do deserve damnation. I remember as a child, I was an Arminian, raised in an Arminian church, and on the school bus riding home from school one day, I had a discussion with fellow Arminians as to whether uh, you would die and go to hell if you used a profanity and then died without repenting. And of course, that's the sort of thinking that leads to the distinction between venial and mortal sins. Uh, the Arminians simply were not as consistent as, in the Roman, as the Romanists in developing their distinctions. Uh, they did, however, come up with a distinction that is very useful. They said uh, <clears throat> they minimize the sinfulness of man, but they restrict mortal sin to known sin. And if you have any familiarity with holiness or Wesleyan or Arminian churches, that is the phrase that they use all the time, known sin. That's uh, their equivalent of mortal sin. Repentance, which in the Bible means simply a change of mind, was transformed by the idea of free will and works and became total surrender and finally penance. Pastoral counseling became auricular confession as counseling was first formalized and finally made mandatory. Once Sola Scriptura was rejected in the early church and again in the centuries after the Reformation, subjective sources of truth were asserted and religious subjectivism became rampant. Having abandoned the objective word of God as the rule of faith and practice, it became necessary to manage the resulting religious chaos in the churches in some way. The substitute for the Bible that developed over the centuries was the Roman state church. Ecclesiastical power was concentrated first in the bishops, then in the Bishop of Rome. Over the centuries, the Bishop of Rome developed a bureaucracy called a curia. This institution claimed to be infallible and usurped the role of teacher, which she called by its Latin name uh, the Magisterium. It is no accident that the Roman State Church has claimed the titles Christ specifically forbade to man. She calls her priests fathers, and she calls herself teacher. These titles are a reflection of the complete anthropocentrism 
of the Roman state church and her denial of the complete theocentrism of Christianity. Christ gave his command not to call any man teacher or father because there is only one father and there's only one teacher. In the century since the Reformation, the shift from epistemological objectivity to epistemological subjectivity, from sola scriptura to epistemological pluralism, has permeated all of theology. Efforts to control this religious subjectivism in Protestantism also took the form of the development of the power of bishops, as seen in Methodism and Lutheranism and Anglicanism. Today we have the spectacle of Charismatics and Pentecostals adopting episcopacy as a remedy for disorder in their churches. Without the word of God, rulers in both civil and ecclesiastical governments opt for authoritarianism and tyranny to end chaos and anarchy. Church order in which the freedom of the Christian is protected is founded on sola scriptura. And it is that principle that the Roman state church and many lesser organizations have rejected. Given this theological and ecclesiastical deterioration in the past 400 years, which in many ways recapitulates the deterioration of the first centuries after Christ, we can now see that evangelicals and Catholics together and its counterparts in other churches, the Lutheran Romanist Accord, which was recently announced, for example, logical outcomes of the abandonment of the principle of sola scriptura. They are not sudden and inexplicable developments, they are almost predictable. Having realized that there is very little of any theological importance that distinguishes contemporary Protestant churches from the Roman estate church, having experienced the splendor of the Roman state church, and it is full of splendor, the beauty of her cathedrals, her liturgy, her traditions, having recognized the political clout she wields not only from her large numbers and vast wealth, but also from her status as a political institution, many contemporary Protestant leaders are urging a theological alliance with Rome. Barring an outpouring of the knowledge of God by the Holy Spirit, these trends will continue and possibly accelerate. After evangelicals and Catholics together and their Lutheran, Anglican, mainline Protestant and charismatic counterparts issue more statements and reach more concords, congregations and perhaps entire denominations, not just individuals, will join the Roman State Church. Of course, there will be many more individual defections to Rome. We have just seen a trickle so far. The Roman State Church will bend over backwards to accommodate her prodigal children and welcome them home, yielding everything that does not infringe on her central doctrine, the magisterium of the Roman State Church. She intends to become the dominatrix of the world, just as she was the dominatrix of Europe during the Middle Ages. She has already ended, for all practical purposes, the Latin Mass. The new Romanist service is much more like a neo-evangelical service than it was 40 years ago. In making such cosmetic changes, the Roman State Church has yielded nothing significant, nor yielded anything permanently, but she has gained a great deal. I'll venture this evening to make some specific predictions. Billy Graham, the most visible leader of the neo-evangelicals, will, should God spare his life, induce, endorse future pro-Romanist statements. He has already offered high praise for Roman Catholics and Romanism, incorporating them into his crusades. His son Franklin Graham will make further approaches to Rome, as will other Arminian evangelists and leaders. Some prominent leaders who we think today we can count on will either remain silent or endorse the ecumenical movement. The alliance between neo-evangelicals and Romanists in the cultural wars will lead to all sorts of new joint ventures and institutions. It will result in the election of our second Romanist president. It will result in the adoption of more programs at the state and federal level to funnel money to Roman state church and neo-evangelical institutions. The next pope will press even more energetically the ecumenical program of the Roman state church, meeting himself with American church leaders not simply sending his third in command, Cardinal Edward Idris Cassidy. Those leaders, in turn, will be deceived by the splendor of the papacy. As this movement grows, there will, of course, be many who oppose it, but they will become more and more isolated in their churches. They will be criticized as troublemakers, as divisive, as unchristian and unloving. 
Many will be forced to leave the churches they are now attending and will learn to cooperate with Christians who are not of their denomination. Denominational boundary lines will break down completely as the grand coalition of Romanist Charismatics and Erzatz Evangelicals gathers momentum, influence, and power. On the one side, there will be an international movement for the evangelization of the world. On the other, there will be a remnant of faithful Christians who will do their best to preserve, protect, and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. My prognostications assume that history is drawing to a close, that the time of judgment has come and that we are entering the final conflict, but that may not be so. Perhaps a gracious God will grant repentance to millions as the remnant proclaim his gospel in ever clearer and bolder terms. Should such an outpouring of the knowledge of God occur, should the gospel of justification by faith alone be proclaimed in its pristine purity and power, then we may expect the Roman state church to suffer another defeat in her plans for world domination. But we do know from scripture that she will eventually and temporarily be victorious only to be consumed by the breath of him who shall come in the twinkling of an eye to vindicate his saints and his church. In the long run, Christians have every reason to be optimists, not because we are so powerful or so numerous, but because the right man is on our side, the man of God's own choosing. One little word from him will end the tyranny of Rome forever. Thank you for coming.